calling all detectives. A gang of bandits hold up a bank and fire a warning burst from a machine gun loaded with blank cartridges. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. Believe me, Jerry Browning, private detective. Big-time crooks rehearse their stuff as carefully as actors. The gang leader who was carrying the submachine gun fired a burst into the bank ceiling. This is a stick-up, see? Okay, boys, scoop up the dough! Standing well out of camera range, the bank president and I watched the scene being filmed. Personally, it wouldn't have fooled me for a second. Because when the gang chief fired into the ceiling, no bullet scars appeared. His machine gun was obviously loaded with blank cartridges. But a moment later, when the gang chief stalked up to the teller's window and slugged the teller with a blackjack, it seemed to me that he was carrying realism too far. The teller slid down out of sight as the two other masked men scooped bundles of money into a canvas bag. Alongside of me, the bank president gasped. Immediately, an assistant director clapped a hand over the president's mouth. With a final warning burst of phony gunfire, the bandits backed to the door and disappeared. In the same moment, the bank president tore himself free from the assistant director and dashed out to the center of the floor. Stop those men! They robbed my bank! The director jumped up, too. Cut! Cut! He ran out to where the bank president was standing. Mr. Primor, you've ruined this team! Now we'll have to take it over! Not in my bank, you won't! Those men slugged my teller and stole all the money! Real money! A movie holdup in a bank turned into the real thing when the film bandits stole what turned out to be $120,000 in real money. <laughs> Up to that point, I'd been a spectator. Now the bank president remembered me. Browning, you work for the Bankers Association. Where did you let it happen? It was no time to point out that Mr. Traymore had himself made all the arrangements. Instead, I went on outside and joined Captain Jorgen of the burglary squad. Jorgen and his men were fussing around the trailer that had served as a dressing room for the actors. Inside it were three men, stripped down to undershirts and shorts, tied up and gagged. After we released them... They came in here, jumped us, took our clothes away. What happened? Well, it was obvious enough what had happened. A smart gang found out about the movie holdup, took it over and made it real. Also, they made a clean getaway. The afternoon papers gave the story a big play, bearing down heavily on its comic elements. It was all very funny, except for the teller in the hospital with a fractured skull and the bank out $120,000. Henry Clay Williamson, head of the local Bankers Association, was a big red-faced man with no sense of humor. Browning, we hire you to protect banks, not to stand by while they're being robbed. I don't care what the circumstances may be. I opened my mouth and closed it again. Don't tell me anything about Traymore giving that movie company permission to shoot. Traymore's a fatuous, edel-headed fool. Go on out, recover the money, arrest all persons responsible, and don't put in an expense account. I grinned weakly. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Williamson. At the Seneca, the best hotel in town, I found the movie director, George Kalmas, packing his bags. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Kalmas. You're staying in town a while. I do as I please. Your stupid bunker ruined my scene. Now I must find some other location and do it over. Sure. But not until that money is recovered. I have an idea your company may be responsible for what happened. By the way, just what company is it? Kalmas turned red, produced a card. Grandeur Productions of America, George Kalmas, producer-director. I put the card in my pocket. Fine. I'll check on your company immediately. In the meantime, if you try to leave town, you'll be put under arrest. I made a call to Hollywood, learned that Grandeur Productions was good for up to $10 million, and that George Kalmas was their fair-haired boy, or had been up until that morning. Now, I gathered, he was on his own. At police headquarters, Captain Jorgen wasn't optimistic. <laughs> too much confusion after the holdup. <clears throat> Gave them too much of a start. It'll take a lucky break to solve this one, Browning. I groaned. <laughs> 
Oh, if we don't solve it, I'm a cooked goose with the Bankers Association. Jorgen Grant. You have played for a chump, Browning. Letting a real hold up be stays right under your nose. <laughs> After being in this business as long as you have, it's about time you recognize the real thing from a phony. But Jorgen, that gang leader used a machine gun with blank cartridges. I stared at the amused cop. You're right, Jorgen. I should be able to tell the real thing from a phony. I went back to Kalmus, the director. Found him sitting morosely in his room. Mr. Kalmus... If you don't help me solve this hold-up, you're just as washed up as I am. Because your company doesn't want to hear about your troubles. Now, this assistant director of yours, the one who prevented Tremor from giving the alarm on time, what do you know about him? He is the son-in-law of the president of Grandeur Pictures. What else do you want to know? Nothing. Just forget I ever mentioned it. I was almost licked but not quite. In a suite at a smaller hotel, I found the three actors who were supposed to play the bank robbers. I walked in on them, announced, You're under arrest, charged with aiding in a bank robbery. Get your coats, we're going to police headquarters. Two of them got up meekly enough. The third mumbled something about getting his coat from the bedroom and tried to get out through the fire escape. <coughs> when I finally got him downtown, he identified himself as Danton Caldwell, a bit player. For two hours, he claimed he knew nothing about the bank robbery. Finally, wilted when confronted with a record of a previous arrest on the coast, admitted that he and a group of actors had planned the holdup. Before morning, police surrounded the hideout where the three amateur bank robbers were waiting for Caldwell to join them. He did. In a cell. How did I know the job was planned by somebody in the movie company? Because of that machine gun loaded with blanks. A gang of real bank robbers might take over a movie setup, but they'd provide their own weapons, not use prop guns. Yet, strangely enough, it was the prop gun with its blank cartridges that made the robbery succeed, that kept me from interfering. Like I said, I've seen some fine acting from big-time crooks, but I never met one yet who loaded a gun with any other purpose than to kill. It's only in the movies that they fire blanks and people fall down on cue. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. <laughs>